Hi, welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh, and we are going to talk about the Diels Alder reaction today, or pericyclic reactions. All right, so Diels Alder. Diels Alder reactions really happen with conjugated dienes, okay? And really, what you usually see is you see cis conjugated dienes that are reacting with some kind of double bond or just regular alkene or alkyne, something that has pi electrons. So let's do kind of the classic version of the Diels Alder reaction. Here, what we have is we have the diene. The diene, you can always tell because it has two double bonds. That's what a diene is, okay? And in this case, yes, it needs to be a conjugated diene, which we learned in the last video, it means that it has alternating single and double bonds. Then you have this ene, right? <laughs> or a double bond, some kind of al alkene or alkyne, some kind of um, uh, pi bonds in some way, shape, or form. And what's interesting here is that you have the diene, and then they don't call this one the ene, they call it the dienophile. Now why do they call it a dienophile? The reason why is because basically philia in Greek means loving. So in this case, we're going to have something that loves dienes. Okay, and what happens here is basically the dienophile, uh, th there's no real nucleophile, electrophile, at least classically, kind of that we think about. Okay, because multiple things are going to happen all at the same time here. And you could maybe arbitrarily label one versus the other, and people do. Um, but it's better to just kind of get a sense that it's all happening at once. It's a concerted reaction. Okay, so what happens here is that the double bond, the pi bond here, becomes a new bond between this carbon and this carbon, okay? This double bond becomes a double bond between these two, but basically because when this bond is formed, no carbon can have five uh, things around it, okay? Although they've done recent studies that say that actually they can. Um, but it takes a lot to make carbon make five bonds. And so in organic chemistry, your clue into everything is that unless you're doing cutting edge research where you're making things happen, four bonds is the way to go, okay? And then you also have a new bond formed between um, this carbon and this carbon. So in other words, what I get is out of two different molecules, I get a single cyclic molecule that looks like that, okay? Now, what happens here, okay? You just saw what happens. The first thing that happens is that this is a dienophile, and when this makes this bond, it forces everything else to move, okay? So, just in terms of thinking about it, right, for a moment, let's do a little breakdown here. We have CH2, just so that you can really see why it is that as soon as the first one occurs, everything ha else has to move. And we'll do this. This is a C and an H, and a C and an H. Okay, so as soon as this pi bond comes into contact or close to this carbon. And that's what you would, if you were gonna label anything the electrophile and nucleophile, you would label this the nucleophile and this the electrophile, okay? So what happens here is that it forms a bond. And what that bond is gonna be is it's gonna form a bond between those two Cs, okay? Now, when that happens, no H's came off. Nothing happened that changed this carbon except that it formed a new bond. And if you can look at this for a minute, carbon already had one, two, three, four bonds. When it forms a new bond, it can't take extra bonds here, which means that this bond has got to move. Okay, and that's exactly why that bond moves. But as soon as that bond moves, this carbon has, doesn't change at all, 
But this carbon with a new double bond right there is going to have one, two, three, four, five bonds. That doesn't work, which means it's going to have to make a new bond over here. And this in pink is showing you what actually forms in the end. Okay? All right. Having said this, okay, what I would suggest is I would suggest figuring out how your arrows are going to move in order to make your new stable-ish product. Okay, it's a more stable product, else it wouldn't happen that way. And you can manipulate conditions to make it go better, but that's basically what's happening. Okay. Now, do we manipulate the diene a fair amount? Sure we do. Do we manipulate the dienophile to make it more reactive? Of course we do, right? If we want things to get a little more interesting, which of course we always want things to get a little more interesting in organic chemistry, we can manipulate both of these. So I'm gonna keep this one up here and show you what happens if I have different kinds of reactants and products or dienes and dienophiles, okay? Let's say that I come with a diene that's a little bit different. How about that one? All right, there's my diene. And let's do a dienophile that's um, interesting as well. Let's do a dienophile that's like this where it's trans, right? So this is a trans um, dienophile. Okay, if I do this, right, then I know my arrows go in such a way that there's a new bond that's gonna be formed between these two. This one is gonna have to be broken, right? And this one is gonna have to form a new bond between those two, okay? So when that happens, I always form a six-membered ring, and the way we start to draw these is kind of funky, like that, right? My double bond that was formed is there. This, because it was trans to begin with, ends up being trans in the end as well, right? You can't actually change that very easily. And then some of you might be saying, well, where did this part go? Well, that becomes a bridge. Okay, all right, much more different than you thought, right? So here's the thing, when you're looking at this, still the same kind of reaction, the carbon that's part of the diene, the two carbons on either side of the ends of the diene, ends of the diene, uh, become the, the reacting carbons, right? So I get a reaction between this guy and that guy, it's gonna form a six-membered ring, but when we see that six-membered ring and it has a bridge, we draw it kind of differently, and you'll notice how I did that, right? So I did kind of this idea, right? There's my double bond that's right here, right? And if it was trans, if the dienophile was trans to begin with, it ends up being trans in the end. And then basically, this is the five-membered ring that we had to begin with. Okay. Oh, kind of crazy. All right, one more. Let's do one more that is kind of interesting, okay? Because while we can do bridged ones, and you'll often see bridged ones, bridged, new bridged products made, because often the cis dienophiles were in a cyclic compound to begin with. And whenever you have a cyclic compound as the, di or as the diene, sorry, the, the diene, the beginning diene is a cyclic compound. And that's because cyclic compounds have pretty exclusively as cis. Remember I told you it needed to be as cis as a diene? It doesn't always happen that way, but it's easier right, if it is, okay? All right, often this is a cyclic compound, which means you're gonna have some kind of something right there, okay?
Okay, let's do one more. All right, let's do this. And let's do this. Oh, lordy, making it complex, aren't I? Okay, so sometimes you put groups on the diene to make it more reactive. This is a classic example of putting groups on the diene to make it more reactive. Okay, here I have two carbonyls. Those carbonyls are pooling electron density away from the di uh, the ene, sorry, the double bond, so that it becomes more reactive in this case. It has more of a desire to react. And in that case, you might think of it the opposite direction, right? That this might be the beginning nucleophile. This might be the more prominent electrophile in that case. Because then if you're pulling electron density away from that double bond, it might have a little bit more of a reason to react. But like I said, people do all kinds of things in this. And I've seen it all different ways. All right, so let's do our regular moment. And I always do it the same way, because then it helps. OK, I have a bond forming right there. Now, where is this bond forming? Well, it forms from the top of the double bond to the first C in the diene, right? So that's the bond that's forming from that pi, those pi electrons. Then I have this double bond become a uh, double bond right there. That forces this double bond to go out. And what is this one? This one is going between those two. OK, six-membered ring is formed, right? That six-membered ring is formed. That's awesome. But I still have that guy on it, don't I? Hmm. OK, that guy did not go away. That guy is still there. And it can actually be forced up or it can be forced down. Almost always, it's going to be forced down. And the reason for that is because I still haven't drawn the bridge here or the double bond. There's my double bond. That's this double bond right here. And the bridge now is right here, right? So it has two carbons in it. OK? So instead of just having one carbon in it going up, it has two carbons. OK? Th that bridge is pointing straight up. So that means that it's less sterically hindered if this is pointing down a bit. OK? And some people kind of enforce that. Maybe they'll put some dashed moments to show that it's going away from the bridge. Maybe they'll make this a little bit more clear and make it a little more filled in. So it's really clear that if this one were coming at me, the way I've drawn this, if these the six-membered ring for the diene was in, or for the Diels-Alder reaction, was in the plane of this glass, this one would be coming at me, and this part would be going away from me. In other words, what we need to find out is we need to basically say that they're opposite one another so that the steric hindrance is minimized. OK? There's going to need to be practice done in order to get this better. And lots and lots of practice is always helpful in the midst of organic chemistry. All right. Until I see you next time, adieu.